Psalms 116, verse 7. This is a scripture that I felt like he, he spoke to me. And I just want to give you some convictions that I have. And I'm going to talk about something. So this is it. It's, it says, return to your rest, O my soul. I feel like this is for the upper room. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you, or for the Lord has been good to you, that in his goodness, you have to force yourself to come back to the place of rest. Because that's actually where his goodness is discovered. Here's what I'm learning, is that influence is overrated. I'm learning that the goal of my life is not to be influential. The goal of my life is to be intimate with Jesus. And whatever comes forth from that place, come what may, intimacy with Jesus is what produces the fruit. And I'm realizing that there's people that are actually influential for Jesus, but they're not intimate with Jesus. Just because someone's in, influential does not mean they're intimate. And this group of people living in proximity to the presence of Jesus is kind of what, what got us into this mess to begin with. And what I really want to go after is I don't want to go after influence. I want to go after impact. And what the upper room is, the upper room is not a movement that's supposed to sweep the earth. The upper room is supposed to be local communities of people living in proximity to the presence of Jesus regularly. And I, I want you to be impacted deeply and profoundly by this community and by what God's doing in this community. It, 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 yes, what happens out there is important, but what happens in here is unto what is happening out there. And so like one of the focuses that we're coming back with is to get you connected to those around you. Like to really, as overseers of your soul, as pastors, as those that are creating and catching up, to creating to the growth momentum is so that you can actually know people that you're worshiping with. Because there are some phenomenal people around here. And as with any season of the upper room, God always ends up highlighting someone that just seems like they're the perfect fit for the job. And my brother-in-law, I don't know if y'all know Josh a little John, would you stand up? So this is, this is, uh, this is Josh Little John. Uh, he moved here, he moved here to be a part of the upper room, and then we uh, hired Nacy to do Samuel School, and they've just done a phenomenal job, and Josh has just been such a servant, just anything that we've needed, but it is so apparent to me that he's to be the connections pastor here at Upper Room Dallas. So from now on, we're going to call Josh Pastor Josh. Do you like that? Maybe. call you Pastor Josh. So Josh, you'll be seeing and hearing a lot more from Josh, but we just have some things in the, in the works and makes to get you connected to those that you're around. Because it's really important. For impact, we've got to know one another. We've got to be intimate, not only with him, but with one another. So we're really going really gonna to go after that thing. But, but here's, what, here's what I felt like um, the, Lord, the, Lord, the Lord said. He, said. he said, rest, rest, rest that oftentimes the Lord begins to move and the enemy comes right next to a move of God and he begins to push those that are close to it. And then as the Lord breathes and things start to move, we feel forced to a place where we have to start working in order to sustain what he began. And what began in rest, because this whole thing has begun in rest, we're going to maintain a posture of rest, and we're going to fight for that. And I believe tonight, like the importance, I feel like it really landed this morning, and I feel like it's going to land tonight, that this is a pastoral word for the upper room. I feel a deep, weighty sense of God's presence upon this message for us as a community. And, and, and it, is, it is that we have to get back as leaders, staff, in a core group of people to the place of rest. And so I just want to unpack biblically what that means, and I want to give you some practical ways to incorporate it, this into your life. Is that all right? Yeah. So uh, the, Lord, 
the Lord said, trade busy and buzz for peace and love and get back to the Sabbath. And so I want to give you three things tonight. I want to talk about the purpose of the Sabbath. I'm going to talk about Sabbath tonight. Talk about the purpose of the Sabbath. I want to talk to you about consequences to not observing the Sabbath. And I want to give you just some practical ways uh, that you can incorporate the Sabbath into uh, your week. Yay? So Genesis chapter 2. Flip over there. <clears throat> first fruit principles are so important. This is a first fruit truth. First time it's mentioned. It sets the tone for the truth, the rest of the Bible. And in Genesis chapter 2, this sabbatical, this rest, this Sabbath reality, God, God institute, God implements. And, and I, I, I just, it's such a profound thing. Uh, Genesis chapter 2 verse 1, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their host. And by the seventh day, God completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, because in it he rested from all of his work, which God had created and made. Very familiar with this account. This is day seven, the first week, one through six, God is speaking, creating, and then on the seventh day, it says that he rested from his work. And this tells us why he rested from his work. There's seven words I want to highlight to you. Um, It says that the Lord completed. Everyone say completed. Completed. So the heavens and the earth were completed. So the heavens, the earth, the earth that we're walking upon, the the earth that we know, the heavens and the sky, it was completed. He had created all that it needed in the course of six days. And so once it was completed, by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested. He rested from that which he had done. He sanctified. He rested. Put Put the next slide up. So these are the seven words. Completed, completed, done, rested, done, sanctified, rested. This describes the seventh day. This is why God called the seventh day holy and Sabbath and rested in it because he was finished. Now there's some things that I've observed about uh, the seventh day that were different than the previous six. If you read Genesis chapter one all the way through and you look at all six days, the writer of Genesis, after each day, he made this comment about the day. If you look at Genesis chapter one, verse three, after the first day, he says this, evening and morning and day one. Then he talks about what was created in day two and then he says it was evening and morning, day two. Then he talks about what was created in day three, and then at the end of day three, he said it was evening and it was morning, a third day. And he does that all six days. He says that there was evening and there was morning. But on the seventh day, this is fascinating to me, the writer does not put that description of the seventh day. He does not say there was evening and there was morning on the seventh day. And I started thinking about why Why didn't he say evening and morning on the seventh day? I don't know. (laughs) Strange. And so I really started thinking about this seventh day. Like it was different than the previous six. The seventh day was different than the previous six. Now, most of us, we know what happened in the six, and then we realize, okay, God rested on the seventh day. But because this description wasn't in the seventh day, something is different about the seventh day than the previous six. It's not that God is just taking a break because he was tired, fatigued a little, he was bored. There was something about this day and the reality of this day that was different than all the rest. And and as I I really started sitting in this, it it began to like grow teeth and really like bite into my heart. (laughs) Like this revelation just started really digging deep into my heart. And I realized how crucial it is for those that are in Jesus Christ to understand the power of the seventh day. 
Because these words, completed, completed, done, finished, he rested, sanctified, like those are really, really important words, not only in the creation account, but they're also very important words for us as born-again believers who have been placed in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to get there in just a second and show you how important this is for you to live in life and life to the full in Jesus. And what the Lord began to show me is that the Lord, the Lord did not rest from his work because he was tired. He didn't rest from his work because he was trying to model something for us in the course of seven days that we, like him, should observe this day of rest and rest from our work because he needed the rest that we need. Our rest is different than his. And I'll get to that. But the Lord rested From his work, not because he was fatigued, the Lord rested from his work because it was complete and done. The Lord Lord rested from his work like a painter would rest from painting the most, like the, the greatest masterpiece that's ever been painted. Once they were done, they stepped back and rested or ceased from their work because there was nothing left to do. A prosecuting attorney who has laid out the case before the judge, before the jury, before the defense. Once he is finished laying out his case, he has been working, he has been grinding, he has been building a case. And then all of a sudden he stands up and he says, the prosecution what? Why? Because they're tired? No, because they're finished. This is the type of rest God was taking on day seven. Now the reason I believe there wasn't an evening and morning in day seven is because this Sabbath rest reality would, was supposed to be present for the rest of creation. So Adam is, Adam, so thank God Adam was created on day six, because there's a lot happening the previous days. Like, Adam would be dodging mountains and trees and rivers and like, (laughs) think about it. He created the created order. It's beautiful. It's awesome. And then God creates Adam on day six. It's the only thing he did on day six. He creates him. He takes dust, (sighs) breathes into him. Adam falls asleep. I'm assuming God, day, night, on day seven, Adam awakes, God is resting because he's finished, and Adam's first day as a human, his first day, his first experience in life is in the rest of God. It's in the finished work of God. Now, I believe that Adam was to live from that place perpetually. I don't believe Adam was going to, like, that was a Sunday, and Monday was coming, and he needed to go to work. That's not the reality that God created for Adam. God created an order that that would supply all that Adam needed. Now, listen, Adam, in Genesis chapter 2, we see that the earth and the created order would be partnered with Adam cultivating and growing the potential of the earth, but he would do that co-laboring with God. It wouldn't be toilsome. It would be his purpose to co-labor with him. It would be purposeful, but it wouldn't be through the sweat of his brow, and it wouldn't be this hard like grind that causes stress and pressure. It would have been enjoyment. It would have been glorious. It would have been so beautiful, but it wasn't until sin entering into the picture that this rest was ruined and spoiled. Are you following me? So Adam's first day was God's last, and God's like kick back, chill. He's resting from his created order, and he's like, Adam, be fruitful and multiply, bro. I've provided all that you need. And listen to me, this is another really, really important point out of Genesis chapter 2. First fruit principle. We've got Sabbath in here, but the other first fruit principle that's in this narrative is that God calls the Sabbath holy. Everyone say holy. 
He sanctified the Sabbath. So the first thing that was ever called holy was rest. Why is that important? It's important because many of us have tricked up, jaded views of what true holiness is. It's important because religion defines holiness different than that. Religion defines holiness by what you're doing and not doing. Religion defines holiness as you reading your Bible, you praying, and you not getting into porn. Now listen, those are the fruits of holiness, I promise. But the root is different. God called the seventh day holy. He called rest holy. He sanctified the activity of rest. Ephesians, 4, Ephesians 1 chapter 4, it says, Before the foundations of the earth, he chose you to be holy and blameless. But when he chose you, he chose you to be holy and blameless so you would rest in the Holy One, enjoy intimacy and union with him, and bear fruit from that place. My point is that many of your unholy behaviors are the fruit of you living in unrest. Your behavior isn't the issue. Your perspective is. I'm really in a good mood too. I am. I'm filled with joy. I just feel an intensity tonight for some of you to get freed from you. You're so busy. And yet your soul's crying out for something and you're trying to medicate and self-medicate. And like, like this biblical reality, you were created for Rest, rest with him. Doesn't mean that you won't work. Doesn't mean there's not purpose. Doesn't mean there's not fire in your heart to go out and change the world. But you do it from a perspective that the work has been complete. When I read Genesis chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3, I see the gospel in there. And I see the gospel because the gospel comes fully furnished. Like when you get born again and the seed of God sets in your heart and you're a new creation, you have everything that you need in that moment. He's just crying out. Look at Luke chapter 9, verse up. Luke chapter 9, verse 58. It's this, it's this crazy revelation about, about Jesus that the, Lord, the Lord's been hitting me with. I want to show you this really quickly. Uh, Jesus said to, uh, to his disciples, Bro, I love you. My little man. So awesome. So listen to this. Watch this. I want to show you how salvation plays into this. Are y'all being blessed? Is this good? Okay. Watch this. This is so fun. This is so fun. All right. Jesus looks at it. Someone wanted to follow him. And, and there's, there's another point, but one of the sub points that he makes in this text, you can read it later. It says, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. He's talking about where foxes live. He's talking about where birds live. But he makes this statement about himself. He says, the son of man has no place to lay his head. Now, it sounds like that scripture is telling us that Jesus was homeless, right? Jesus, Jesus didn't have a home. How many of you have heard it taught that way? Yeah. Jesus didn't have a home. Okay, I, I, yes, Jesus, he traveled from city to city. He didn't have probably a residence on the earth. It's awesome. Cool, but what's significant about that? So I, I just, like, it, it bothered me. I'm like, why, why didn't he have it? He, he, Jesus wasn't poor. Jesus had a following. I'm like, why, why, what was it, Lord? And so I, I started, like, really, really, like, sitting on this text. And, and I looked at this word, uh, tele. And tele in the Greek is klino. Everyone say klino. It's K-L-I-N-O, klino. And klino means to rest. It means to lay or to bow one's head. 
So like when you go to sleep at night, you're cleaning your head on your pillow. You're laying it down. And so I started thinking about clean and I'm like, well, Jesus, you slept at night. You had a place to clean your head. What are you talking about? Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So it like bothered me for a season. And so I was like, I wonder if it's used anywhere else in Scripture. And I found another place where Jesus talks about clean his head. It's fascinating. So Jesus came to the earth on a mission, yes? yes? Jesus came to the earth to liberate you and me from sin. Jesus came to the earth so that he could die our death, so that ultimately we could live his life. Like he who knew no sin became sin. There was a joy set before him, and he knew that he was coming to endure the cross. It wasn't a mystery to Jesus what his purpose was. His purpose was to be nailed to a tree and to make atonement for our sins on that cross. Like he knew his purpose, and he knew that he had a work to do. Isaiah chapter 53 talks about them taking up our diseases, taking up our iniquities, taking up our transgressions, that he would be like a lamb led to the slaughter. We know what that entailed, the 39 lashes, ribbon after ribbon of his skin coming off because by his stripes we are what? Healed. Healed. So he knew for the healing of our bodies that he would go to that pole and they would take a cat of nine tails and part of the work that he came to do was to go to that that pole, be tied up, and literally his back be filleted for your diseases. He knew that that was a part of his work. He knew that he had to be bruised. So there were guards that would come up and just pop him in the face, pop him in the arms. He's got contusions internally. He's not externally bleeding. Because it's, it's iniquity. Iniquity is an inward sin. And it says that he was bruised for our iniquities. So part of his work is that he knew in his flesh he had to be beaten to the point that he would have bruises in his skin upon his body. That's Isaiah 53. I'm certain Jesus studied Isaiah 53. And he knew that sacrifice was him. And he knew that was the work, the work that he would have to accomplish for you and me. It says he was pierced for our transgressions. Iniquity is internal. Iniquity is something wrong on the inside. That's why he was bruised. But, but a transgression is something external. If you transgress tonight, it's an outward act. And so he was pierced. A piercing is external on the skin. So when those, when those nails were going into his arms and his feet, he knew, based on Isaiah 53, that he would be pierced. And that piercing was for your transgression. It was for you. It was for you who looked at porn this week. It was for you. It was for you who drank too much. It was for you who are doing drugs in this room tonight. It was for you who are foul mouthed. Like that, those things, there's a price to them. And Jesus knew that you couldn't pay it on your own. He knew that he would have to come and he would have to do a work for you because you couldn't do it for yourself no one all fell short of the glory of God and Jesus came on a mission to work out salvation for you to fulfill the law to live a perfect life so that that body that's being broken and beaten and torn apart would be a fair and right offering before a righteous God he came to work that for you He came thinking about it. He came knowing that he has to do the perfect will of the Father for you, for me, for us. Because we, we were cut off. We were enemies of God. There was a mission that Jesus Christ had. There was a work that Jesus Christ came to do. It's a work that no one on earth ever born of a woman could have done but him. It's significant the work that he did. It's thorough the work that he did. It's complete the work that he did. He thought about every need in humankind from Hitler to Napoleon to abortion to homosexuality to Donald Trump to Barack Obama to Iran to Iraq to Sub-Saharan Africa to genocide. He thought about every single thing. 
And he worked out God's purposes through the cross, reconciling all of mankind unto the Father. Like the work, the work of Jesus is so very sufficient. Jesus wasn't just a good teacher. Jesus wasn't just divine. He wasn't spiritual. Jesus was God Almighty as a man working out a redemptive plan of salvation for mankind for all of time. This is the difference in Christianity and any other religion. It's what Jesus accomplished. It's the work of the cross. It's so central to who we are as his people. You can't add to it and you can't take away from it. The son of man. He had no place to lay his head. How does this fit into that? I'll show you how it fits into that. Because it was on that cross, bloodied, beaten, mutilated. It says there was nothing in his looks that we would esteem him. People say that's because Jesus was ugly. Jesus was not ugly. He was handsome, I believe. They're talking about, they're talking about how transfigured he was on that cross. We wouldn't esteem him. We would, re, just, we would turn away. He was so disfigured, so perverted in the image of God, completely just ugh, hanging on that cross. And as he's there, they offer him a sour wine, and it says he drank the wine. And in John chapter 19, verse 30, Jesus utters three words, three very important words. He said this, he says, it is finished. It is finished. What's finished? The plan of salvation. And it's in that moment, that word for bow, he bowed. The Son of Man clean out his head. The Son of Man found a place to rest his head. And it's on that cross after he uttered those words because his mission had been complete. It's finished. The work was done. What Jesus is saying is he's saying, I can rest now. This is Genesis chapter 2 at the cross. Holy Spirit spoke to me. In this revelation about believers, this is what the Holy Spirit said to me. Holy Spirit said to me, I live in many, but I rest in few. I live in many. Many are born again. Many are my temples. But I rest. I rest in few. I said, what do you mean? He said, the Son of Man is still looking for a place to lay his head. What are we tonight? What are we tonight? We're the body of who? We're the body of Christ. Who's our head? Jesus is our head. So what does it look like for the head to rest upon your life and upon us as a community? Let me tell you what it looks like for him to rest his head. It looks like us boasting in his work. It looks like us resting in what he has provided for us. It looks like you ceasing from your work to try to attain what he already purchased for you. You see, when I, when I think of it is finished, when I think of it is finished, I think of another word. I think of it is done. Everyone say done. Listen, if you're born again, the work is finished. You have everything that you need tonight to live victoriously, to live as an overcomer, to live holy, to live blameless, to live life, life abundantly. It is done. Now, when I think of the word done, can you put that up there? Done. It's an interesting word. 
There's a, like, I know we think of four-letter words are bad, but I think there's a lot of like righteous four-letter words. <laughs> One of them's come, like all come. Love that word. The other one's done. The work is done. Now listen, the Sabbath reality, the Sabbath reality is that you rest in the done. But in the done, listen, because everyone like starts manifesting. They're like, well, well, are we supposed to like follow him? And are we supposed to like bear fruit and change the world? And, da, 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 da. and I'm like, yes, you are. You are. There's a do in the done. Do you see it? Do you see it? There's a do in the done. There's a do in the done. When you live in the done, you will start to do things. I'm not saying you're not going to do anything. You're going to do a lot for the Lord, but you're going to do it from the done. You're going to do it from the place of rest. But listen, because many of you aren't resting in the done, you have a lot of do, 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 do in your life. And you know what I mean by that. It's stinky. Stuff's happening. Come on. It's funny, but it's true. As soon as you start living the do life, man, things get out of whack. But when you're resting in the done, all of a sudden your do is well beyond what you could ever have done. We need to do the done. Hijack that from Mountain Dew. We'll do the done. Come out with a sports drink. <laughs> we do the done, man. The work is finished. The work is completed. And when we rest in him, listen, when you were born again, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, it says, for God who is rich in mercy, he saw you. You were dead in your trespasses. You were dead in your trespasses. And it says that he made you alive in Christ. He made you alive. And you know what he did? He raised you up. And then where did he place you? Does anyone know? Where did he place you? What does that scripture say? He's, okay, in heavenly places, yes. You're in Jesus, yes. But there's a position that it says. It says you're seated. When you got born again, you didn't get born again walking with God. You didn't get born again to run with God. You didn't get born again to stand with God. You got born again so that you could be seated in Christ. Your relationship with Jesus began in the place of rest. His first commission to his disciples, Matthew 10, I believe it's verse 10. He said, freely you've received, freely give. Meaning the first one sent out as evangelists, the only thing they had is what they had received from Jesus. The Christian life is about receiving. It's about receiving from him who is your source. We do the done. The work is finished. That's why sabbaticalizing your life, like incorporating sabbatical rest is so crucial for your health and for your freedom. Is it that? Is it really that good? Is it, is it really that good? Yes, that's why it's the good news. It's really that good. So one, one of the things, listen, here, here's the thing. All right, so we're talking about the Sabbath, talking about, so the Lord, the Lord then would command, like it made the top 10. Like, don't steal. Don't sleep around. Don't have any other gods before me. Honor your father and mother. But number four is a big one. He said, honor the Sabbath. It's a commandment from God. It's not a suggestion. It's like, hey, if you, if you have time, if you work into your schedule, like just maybe a half day. That's not what he says. He, he, he prescribes something for us. Listen, I, I, will, I, I have zero plans on, on stealing something anytime soon. <laughs> like, I, I take that serious. Like, I, I don't want to steal. I, 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 I'm not. I, like, I love my wife. I'm going to be faithful to her. Like, I know... I know, like, I don't just like, oh, I slipped up there. <laughs> what? It doesn't make sense. Yet when it comes to this one, it's like, oh, okay. Rest, okay, I'll sleep in. That's not what he said. He, he said, during your work week, take 24 hours, 24 hours, and cease from your work. 
Why is that so crucial? Because your soul needs it. Your soul does. You were created for rest. In Exodus chapter, can I keep going? Yes. Look at Exodus 16 real quick. Uh, Exodus, let's do 31. Exodus 16 is good. We'll get there later. I don't even know what Exodus 16 is. I just made that up. <laughs> Exodus 31. <laughs> Aaron, you like that. All right, Exodus 31. This is so fun. So this is the Lord speaking to the Israelites. He says, he says, but as for you, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, you shall surely observe my Sabbath. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Here it is again, sanctify, holy. Therefore, you to observe the Sabbath, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does, not, does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. So we see two consequences here. The first is if you were caught working on the Sabbath, you die. That sounds pretty significant. And in Numbers chapter 16, they found a dude picking up sticks. And because they hadn't been adhering to the Sabbath, they didn't know what to do. They knew he was breaking, but they didn't know what to do. Same with the Moses. And Moses had to inquire the Lord. And the Lord looks at Moses and he says, kill him. Why? Because he was picking up sticks. What? There's a principle here. And the principle is if we don't adhere to the Sabbath, our bodies manifest death. Like a lot of your emotional and physical stuff that you're going through, most likely it could be because you're not resting. Stress, insomnia, depression, and we just don't know how to do it. I, like our bodies are just so unaccustomed to resting. Like even if you attempt to take, I'm, man, I am the worst at this. I, am, I, 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 I can be a little ADHD. I can. You can probably tell. But, but like... It's the beautiful creative side of me, but me resting and silencing and like coming to a place of stillness, it takes time for me. It takes discipline. It doesn't just happen. I have to fight for it. And, and, and for me, it's like really, really scheduled because I know the fruit of it will bring life and I'm honoring my soul. But this says if you don't, that the person would die, but I think it's a principle that, that death comes. It also says that you'll be cut off from among your people. And I believe it cuts us off relationally. It says, for six days, verse 15, uh, work may be done, but on the seventh day, there's a Sabbath of complete rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath shall surely be put to death. So the sons of Israel shall observe the Sabbath, celebrate the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant forever. It is a sign between me and you and Israel forever. For in six days, and he, he, he reverts back to the creation account, for in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, but on the seventh day he ceased from labor and was refreshed. It's a sign. The Sabbath is a witness. But somebody that's really impacted my uh, life and revelation on this is Pastor Robert Morris at Gateway. Woo! He's just, yeah, he's such a phenomenal teacher. Um, but he, he really dialed into this about, about uh, the principle of rest. And, and he talks about this specific text. And he talks about uh, the Sabbath being a witness to us. That the Sabbath is a witness. It's a witnessing tool. It witnesses to you that you need to rest because the work has been completed. Like forcing yourself to lie down and forcing yourself to, to settle down every once a week, it's really, really, it reminds you. Yeah. Like Fridays at our house, my wife doesn't cook. No cooking. Some of the mothers are like. And there's a plan that we have in place for cooking because Lord knows I do not need to do the cooking. I said this morning it would be like a fast for the family if I was in charge of food. So we have to prepare for it. But when we prepare for it, like we prepare for that day. It's really, really important. But it's a witness to us. And it's a witness to us that we need rest. And we need to rest from our work. But we also equally, if not more important, is that we're resting in his. Like typically I preach on Sundays if you don't know that. So Friday would be a great time to finalize a sermon because it's my day off and I'm not having to work. I will not. I will not do any sermon prep on Friday, even if I don't have a clue what I'm preaching on Sunday. But what I've realized is when I honor that day, all of a sudden Saturday, without fail, a spirit of revelation hits me, and all of a sudden I know exactly what you need to hear. 
without fail. It happened, it happened this week. I knew I was going to preach on Sabbath, and man, yesterday morning, for about two hours, the Lord showed up and just began to feed me for you. I used to get really freaked out. By Thursday, if I didn't know what I was preaching, man, I was a wreck. You can ask my wife. Like, I'm like, I just, you're going to go to dinner. No, I need to go and study. No, I just need to, I was just this grind, and I just realized that it wasn't from rest. And the Lord has completely changed my approach to preaching. Amen. Completely. And it's all from rest. I do not preach from striving and labor. I preach from complete rest. Amen. Truly. I, I, as God is my witness. But it's a witness, it's a witness to me that this work is about him. It's not about me. It's not about my gifting. So, so, so crucial. Um, Chick-fil-A. How many of you love Chick-fil-A? Come on. Well, let's go. After, after service, let's go to Chick-fil-A today. What's up? How many of you, you like go to Chick-fil-A and you're like, I'll take a number one. I need three kids meals. I need your uh, Arnold Palmer, a lemonade. And then you're like sitting there and you're like, hello. Hello. Oh, it's Sunday. Dang it. You get like really mad. And then you like start rejoicing because you're like, oh, yeah. It's Chick-fil-A, you know? <laughs> There's this article, though. Inc.com wrote an article on Chick-fil-A. Inc.com wrote an article on it. You can look it up. They're talking about Chick-fil-A and just what a phenomenon it is. Because it's, it's, it's telling you the Sabbath is a witness. Because on Inc.com, this is what they say. I don't know corporately. I think Chick-fil-A uh, has said some different things about why they do what they do. Uh, but in this article, it says that Chick-fil-A gives their employees a day for rest and worship, for rest and worship, for rest and worship, which is Sunday. And then the guy starts talking about just the phenomenon of, of Chick-fil-A economically, because economically, the, the food, uh, fast food chains that are comparable to uh, Chick-fil-A, like um, Kentucky Fried Chicken, or I think McDonald's was in there, there were a couple of them, uh, it talks about their numbers. And in 2016, these are factual numbers, in 2016, the average competitor of Chick-fil-A for a single retail shop grossed $1.1 million for that store, per store. Following me? It's his competitors. Chick-fil-A, those stores are open seven days a week. Chick-fil-A is open one day less, and yet they gross $4.4 million. <laughs> Listen, there's a spiritual principle. Seven days of you working will not produce as much fruit as six days you working and giving God one. Like, it's true. It's true. It's true. You will produce more if you incorporate this principle into your life. Take a day off. It's so, so crucial. Take a day off. That's God's gift to you. Take a day off. Take a day off from work. Cease and desist from working. Uh, one more principle. I just have, give me, give me six minutes. One more principle. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 36 is another interesting story about this, about the Sabbath. Um, in Second Chronicles chapter 36, uh, the, the priest wrote Second Chronicles, this priestly account of... Uh, of an event that took place in Israel. So, 2 Chronicles 36, verse 20, it says, those who escaped from the sword, he carried away to Babylon. And they were servants to the king, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and to his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia, which was Cyrus who came and delivered them. But look at this, you see why the Israelites were, went into captivity. This is a fascinating reality. According to the priest, this is written, why the Israelites went into captivity for 70 years. Jeremiah prophesied about it, Daniel lived through it. It's an important, important moment in Israel's history in like 600, 500 B.C., 70 years. Verse 21 tells us why. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah prophesied it would be 70 years until the land had enjoyed its what? What did the land need? The land needed its Sabbaths. All the days of its desolation, so Jerusalem's destroyed, the land kept Sabbath. What's he talking about? Here's what he's talking about. Not only were the Israelites to observe Sabbath on a weekly basis, but there were Shemitah years, which were every seven years. And part of those years, uh, they were to give the land rest. It was a commandment by God. Do not cultivate. Do not farm the land. Give it a year to rest. 
It needs one year to rest. And scientifically in the natural, uh, they've proven that land actually needs rest. Like this is a proven thing. The government, our government will subsidize farmers to give their land rest. Crazy. God's principles are amazing. But they didn't adhere to this. They worked the field. Year, every seven years, they just kept working it. They didn't break. And so what did, what did God do? God, God gave the land a Sabbath rest for all the Sabbaths that they missed. And if you do the math, how many years were they in captivity? 70 years. So follow me here. So how many years were they to work? And then the seventh year was a year of rest, yes? So one, two, three, four, five, six. On the seventh year, give the land rest. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, give the year uh, land rest. But they missed the first seven. They missed the second seven. They missed the third seven. They missed the fifth seven. How many years did they miss Sabbath based on that algorithm? It's seven times 70. It's 490 years that they didn't adhere to the Sabbath. It's crazy. So God sees that, and God gives the land rest. My, my point is this, is that, is that if you are not giving... If you are not giving your body, which is made of dust, rest, it will accumulate and it will affect your body. Like there's a powerful principle here that you need to give your body rest. You reap what you sow. And we need to sow rest into our souls. Yay? So let me just give you three quick things uh, about practical things. Again, these won't take long. Um, here's a practical thing. Take a day off. Take a 24-hour period once a week. Man, just try it. Give this from now till the end of the year. Just try it and see what happens in your work, see what happens in your relationships, see what happens in your marriage. We need to get in rhythms and routines. And one of the rhythms and one of the routines that we need is we need a day of rest. We're in rhythms and routines, morning, noon, and night prayer here. Like, I'm a big believer in rhythms and routines and discipline, and I want to give you the freedom to take a day off and to protect that day, to make it holy, set it apart from the Lord, and cease from work. It'll benefit you greatly. I also want to encourage you, if you're married, your marriage needs this. Your marriage needs, needs a, we have a date night. In, in many ways, the date night is like a Sabbath for us as a couple. We get away from the kids. We get away from the grind. And man, Wednesday nights from 6.30 to 9.30, I know where I'll be and I know who I'll be with. And I know what we won't be talking about. We're not going to talk about ministry. We're not going to talk about church. It's a moment for our marriage to rest and for us to focus and give to one another. I've been married, just celebrated 10 years. And it is the key to us having a healthy, good marriage. We fight for our date night. You're not going to get us on a Wednesday night. You're not. It's too important to the livelihood of our family. And, and just like the date night is for my marriage, the Sabbath is for your soul. Fight for it. Put it in there. Protect it. Set it apart. Mark it down. I promise you. I feel like some of you, if you'll start to do this, you're going to see depression leave. I saw some people, p potentially you're heading off cancer you're heading off diseases that will be life-threatening if you will learn to incorporate rest into your life. Get a hobby. Do that on your Sabbath. I play golf on the Sabbath. One of the things I do, most practical thing that I do on the Sabbath is I don't work. I don't check my emails. I don't respond to texts. I just don't. And it's been so healthy and helpful for me. Rhythms and routine, take a day off. Review your promises. If you have prophetic promises on the Sabbath, a lot of times I just review promises that the Lord's spoken to me. I have a history of them in my phone. Start collecting them. Um, I've got some examples of that for time. I'm not gonna, not gonna use it. Uh, protect your yes. Two more. Protect your yes. What does that mean? Protect your yes. It means what you say no to is really important. Many of us are really busy because we're just responding to life and we're saying yes to anything that comes at us. But listen, especially if you're single, I felt for singles, if you'll take your singleness and you'll find a place of rest in your singleness, I feel like the Lord's going to honor that. I saw a lot of singles getting off dating sites, getting off like going from, some of you are just coming here hopefully to find a spouse, 
Just stop coming here if that's why you're coming. I, I'm not, I mean, we need space. We do. Seriously. Like, I want to help you. I want to help you. I w- I, I'm genuine. I'm not, I'm not saying it to, I'm not saying it like, I, I, listen, if you're here and you're looking for someone, that's great, but get plugged into the mission and vision of this place. Don't just come here because you're trying to like cherry pick cuties. Don't. It's really good. I know. I, I, listen, I'm trying to stop you from a cycle because if you're just coming here to find, to find a girl, you're doing it in a dozen other places and there's this thing inside of you that's driving you to do all these things. I got to click on this and go to this website, maybe go to this place and go to that place and I just say cease, cease from that thing, man. Bury it, give it to the Lord and watch what he does. Yeah. Hey, like you, he's like honoring you. You want to work it your way, you can work it your way, but my way's really, really good. And I know, I know that there's some singles, man, and you're in rest and you're in that place and I want to encourage you to stay in that place to stay in that place and to feed yourself promises that he's spoken to you about that. But just you need to cease, man, from constantly trying to find the one. Rest in him. Watch what he does. I keep looking over here because I guess this is where all the singles are, but that's for everybody. Brother over here said, I'm over here too. (laughs) Oh, that's funny. Oh, wow. So, hey, listen, I, I was saying all that in protecting your yes. Like, when you say no to certain things, it increases your authority. When you say no to certain things, it increases your authority when you say yes. Like, for a long time before we launched the upper room, we were saying no to everything, and it was really frustrating because there were neat things, but the Lord was so jealous saying no, no, no. And if we would have said yes to those things, we would have missed what he was leading us to, and it was this place. Many of you are in a season of saying no, and it's to increase a significant yes. So just protect that. In rest, like you don't have to go everywhere, you don't have to do everything. And the last thing that I wanted to share with you, and then we're going to land it, is thankfulness. We take thankfulness so, so, so very seriously here. Thankfulness is not a holiday. Thankfulness is not just one little revelation that we have and occasionally use. Thanksgiving is a lifestyle that we live. Every prayer set should begin with Thanksgiving. If you're leading prayer, start in Thanksgiving. You don't always feel like it. You don't always muster it up, have the goosey gumpy, goosebump thingy. Just start and force your heart into Thanksgiving and watch what he does. Thanksgiving forces your heart into rest to give him thanks for who he is in your life. Thanksgiving, there's such power in Thanksgiving. Hell is disarmed through Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving disarms depression. Thanksgiving disarms disease. Thanksgiving disarms debt. Thanksgiving disarms all the things that are barking at you. If you can get thankful before the Lord, you'll find yourself in a place of rest, ready to receive what he's going to give you. Because when you're giving something to him, you're positioning yourself to receive something from him. Be thankful. That's a word. So who, who, who here, who here like, who here is like, man, this is, this is Miller. You're getting me. I, I need this. Like, I need, I need to enter into that rest. Would you just stand up? I want to pray for you.